Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. I uh, would like to welcome you to our virtual event this morning with Jeremy Black, who's going to be talking about China and uh, the rise of China and the U.S. relationship with China and our European partners and, and the uh, implications of that. Um, I'd first, before we get started, also like to thank our donors and generous supporters. Uh, the Foreign Policy Research Institute, FPRI, can't survive without your help. So we encourage you, those of you who are supporting us, to continue to do so. And those who are new to us, consider becoming a member. Um, I'd like to now turn it uh, the program over to Devin Cross, who's the vice chairman of our board of trustees. Um, uh, Devin's had graciously offered to host a salon for Jeremy Black in her New York home. Unfortunately, that was uh, um, preempted by the pandemic. So um, Jeremy, um, excuse me, uh, Devin will be introducing Jeremy this morning. And uh, uh, just a little bit about Devin. Um, it's hard to, she has such an impressive resume, it's hard to, to pick a few things to mention. Um, she is the director of the Policy Forum on International Affairs. And among the many things she's done, she was also the director of research at Smith Richardson Foundation. Um, she served on many boards, um, including the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Devin cross. Many thanks, Raleigh, and many thanks again to all of you who are supporting this wonderful, wonderful organization, which, as we were just chatting, you know, went virtual in many respects well before the pandemic and is really doing a brilliant job right now in just stepping up programming to cover all sorts of fascinating topics. Um, nobody covers quite as many fascinating topics as our guest today, Jeremy Black, who is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Exeter and a Senior Fellow at the Policy Exchange in London and FPRI. And he has had a long-standing relationship with us at FPRI and has been a brilliant speaker uh, many times over. Um, and I've had the, the honor of hosting him in my home several times. His Jeremy's area of specialty, if you will, are, he's published, I should start also this off with, he's published probably 140 books. And by that, I mean, he has written 140 books. This is not somebody who's fielding stuff to, to research assistants. He's, he's actually writing these books on everything involving 18th century British, European, American, political, diplomatic, and military history. But when you read 140 books, you cover more ground than that even, and it, he has expanded into the history of the press, cartography, warfare, culture, all sorts of things. Um, his books include a magisterial modern British history, uh, as well as a history of the Holocaust, history and memory, and the all time out of the park hit, uh, The Politics of James Bond. Um, so there's few areas that, that Jeremy hasn't got an interesting commentary to offer, and I really look forward to this now. In the course of this current crisis, the, the place of Europe, despite its agonies at the moment, is of primary importance to us all, and it's also of great strategic interest to the Chinese. So we look forward to your comments, Jeremy. Over to you. Well, good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to start off in the time available by saying that it's understandable that most people think of the current crisis in terms of the two major players, which is China and the United States. But obviously, for both China and the United States, there are other players as well. They are lesser in their consequence, but they nevertheless play a role in international relations. The key ones as far as the Asia-Pacific um, circle is concerned are very apparent. They are you know, Japan and Australia, China, South Korea. But the Europeans are also an aspect of the situation because the United States, fairly enough, expects its allies to at least try and share its goals and also to share its anxieties. And it's there that I want to try and talk a bit, because most of the listeners are, are Americans, 
but I want to try and explain the difficulty of discussing the European response, not in order to um, excuse anything, but just in order to explain it. And also in doing that, to note the significance of a gathering like this, that the Foreign Policy Research Institute organizes, to try and help Americans understand the broader world. So let's start off with the obvious point that the European alliance with the United States is primarily a matter of NATO and was primarily designed to oppose the Soviet Union, which was in control of half of Europe and a threat to the other half from immediately after the Second World War until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in part, what we are talking about is the repurposing of NATO for a broader strategic environment and the extent to which that repurposing is understood more in some European circles than others. Now, I think that's a, a point that's worth bearing in mind. There always were tensions in the NATO alliance over the goals as far as Europe and the Soviet Union was explicitly concerned. There were rifts, Greece versus Turkey, for example, had a long-standing animosity. Some of the NATO powers were proved to be more resolute against the Soviet Union than others. But nevertheless, there was a fundamental, immediate and urgent goal of protecting uh, Western Europe, the North Atlantic, the Mediterranean from the possibility of Soviet attack. Now, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the extent to which Europe tried to have a holiday from history was very apparent in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, when you had security issues in that period, most obviously in former Yugoslavia, only a certain number of the European powers stepped up to play a role, and there was a widespread expectation on their part that America should play the major part, much to the understandable irritation of the Americans. And I think their irritation with the Europeans was quite understandable. That situation became even more apparent in the 2000s in terms of the crisis over Iraq in 2003, with again, and in this case, a much more noticeable uh, division between the Europeans. Uh, countries such as Spain, Britain, Poland proved very willing to align with the United States, whereas France and Germany and a number of others, Belgium, were conspicuously opposed to doing so. And in part, one could argue that the divisions or differences over China are a new version of this older problem. The problem of what do you do with the European-American alliance after the common glue provided by the fear of the Soviet Union has gone. So that's a point that's worth bearing in mind. That point has been ex accentuated by more specific things to do with China. On the one hand, China's uh, soft power diplomacy, its economic muscle, uh, its determined, uh, often aggressive espousal of its own interests has been more successful in many European countries than in others. Um, in particular, European countries that are suffering from a shortage of liquidity, um, classic examples being Greece and Italy, have been much more willing to accept the Chinese blandishments in the sense of belts and braces, the development of infrastructure, um, for example, the harbour facilities at Trieste in Italy, harbour facilities in Piraeus in Greece. Some powers have been much more willing to accept that than others. So that's an important point. Secondly, some powers have been more anxious about Chinese activity in destabilizing activity in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and more generally than others. So that offers, opens up a second rift. And the third rift, which is very important in terms of the response to China, are divisions and differences over attitudes to Russia. In essence, the world's geopolitics was transformed in the early 2000s thanks to 
uh, due to, because there's no thanks for this, due to the reconciliation, the rapprochement between Russia and China. You will remember that the latter stages of the Cold War had been relatively benign for the West because of the animosity between China and the Soviet Union from the 1960s on. Well, in the early 2000s, you know, either depending upon the point, your point of view that the West lost the ball, or it would have happened anyway, but China and Russia became reconciled, and that creates a problem. It creates a problem in that China doesn't really have to fear, certainly in the short term, Russian antagonism and vice versa. So linked to this response to China is the response to Russia. Some European powers, some of them minor ones, relatively minor ones like Cyprus and Malta, some of them possibly more important ones, are not interested in or willing to disagree with Russia to the extent that others are. So I think it's fair to say that there has been sustained anxiety about the attitude of both France and Germany towards Russia. President Macron of France is pressing for uh, Russia to be brought back if, as a full member into the international community as if it had never attacked uh, Ukraine or annexed Crimea. Uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany is unwilling to give the kind of support to Poland, the Scandinavian states, the Baltic republics um, that that they need uh, in order to secure themselves against China. And all of this is of enormous importance. It may seem a long way away, but all of this is an enormous importance as far as the response to China is concerned. One, because there's no doubt at all that China is trying to exacerbate differences between Russia and its neighbors. Two, because the extent to which the United States and its allies, including powers such as Britain, um, can concentrate on China is affected by regional issues elsewhere, whether they're in Europe or for that matter in the Middle East. And three, because from the Chinese perspective, seeing the speed with which people are willing to, as it were, say of of President Putin, well, you know, Crimea was a fault few years ago, let's not talk about that and let's be chummies again, um, is actually almost a green light to saying to, to China, you annoy your neighbours, you take provocative steps, but don't worry, because after a few years, everybody will be very happy to chat to you again on an equal footing. So that is a point and a dimension that needs to be thought about. And it's also rele relevant to the extent of, as it were, the American confrontation or, or uh, relationship with China. The most important thing I think that the Europeans can do, and remember there is no commonality in European response in foreign policy, despite the ambitions of the European Union, but the most useful thing the Europeans can do is one, to keep Chinese blandishments at a distance, and two, to try and ensure that the burden on the United States of protecting or acting as an umbrella for Europe and the Mediterranean is in larger part borne by the Europeans. Now, that has been a strand in American policymaking for a number of years. It's not just this administration. A lot of what we are talking about is bipartisan. Uh, President Obama had already signaled very, very clearly the pivot to Asia. So it's in, this is in no way just simply a response to the current pandemic or to the current policies of the Trump administration. This began long time earlier. And equally, although President Trump has been possibly uh, louder in his calls for the Europeans to pay a greater contribution, that again is not at all new. Those arguments were being made by President Obama. They were being made prior to him by other presidents, including uh, President George W. Bush. So in other words, although it is very tempting to see this simply as a matter of the pandemic, it is in fact a broader question of the nature of the relationship between uh, Europe and um, the United States after the end of the Cold War, as we look at the prospect or possibility of a different Cold War 
fought on different rules, or maybe I should say waged or contested, one hopes, on different rules. And this is a question in which everybody needs to think very rapidly about what the nature of security is in that context, because it is quite apparent that the international organizations that one might wish to feel were up to it, the United Nations, World, Tra World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, are clearly not up to it. It doesn't mean that one throws them away. They still provide useful uh, intermediary uh, institutions for talking to people. But there is a need, particularly on the part of many of the European commentators, to understand that there are choices out there, that at the present moment, they may not wish, wish to see that, but that the Chinese and the Russians certainly do, and that left on their own, many of the individual European states will make short-term opportunistic buck-passing decisions to push the burden on to somebody else. And that, that, that is not only foolish, it is more foolish than the situation at any stage in the last 20 years. There we are, to my time. Oh. That was to my time. I, I beg you, you, you always are to your time. I, beg <laughs> I wasn't sure that that was the, the handoff we were. Oh, no, 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 I can easily oh, go yeah. on, but that was no, to no, my no. time. But boy, oh boy, call it up. Excellent, well, thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, I'll just start with one question and then we'll turn it over to, to the, the broader audience. Um, you talk about the, the Europeans stepping up in, in defending themselves. They've never done this. They've never elected to invest in this. And at this point, they are especially ill-equipped to do so. Moreover, the whole European project is in shambles. It's got, you know, dropping like a stone in terms of uh, uh, trust and popularity amongst the various constituents. And the, the heterogeneity, of Euro, heterogeneity of Europe is asserting itself again. That said, there are huge uh, gems in the European um, landscape of technologies and biotech, life sciences, and, and communications and, and uh, associated uh, technologies. The Chinese are looking very uh, aggressively at these. Uh, the Europeans are asking for support in, uh, amongst other European countries in defending these. How do you see that playing out? It seems to me the security tensions are going to be much more in the financial, the fiscal problems of Europe and these vulnerabilities in these key industries. Well, I think that's true. Can I first say, before we deal with that, just a brief thing on the military side. Um, what I would say is that the uh, contribution of most of the European states was primarily defensive during the NATO context. And actually, they did deploy quite large forces. So the Bundeswehr, the army of what used to be West Germany, uh, was actually the largest individual force in number of troops, as it should have been, uh, on defending the inter-German frontier. But there were also large numbers of um, Dutch, large numbers of Belgians, the Swedish Air Force. Sweden was neutral, but Sweden's Air Force and Sweden's tanks were clearly designed against a Soviet invasion. Sweden had over 450 sort of relatively advanced aircraft and were one of the leaders of the world in tank design. The point is that none of these forces were configured for offensive operations. Pretty well the only people who were uh, were the British and the French, which meant that when um, the nature of the military challenge changed in the 1990s towards expeditionary warfare, initially, obviously, in Yugoslavia, and then, well, initially, I would say Gulf War I, but then Yugoslavia, most Europeans did not have the military to do that. Now, I would agree with you entirely that they have not subsequently adequately developed. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. One, that in a lot of the states, there is no real tradition these days of a large professional military. So you move from what were sort of civilian conscript armies for the Cold War, as in Germany or France, to modern militaries, which have some good sections, but where there is only a limited 
political background. The French are probably the strongest with Britain. I mean, in France, you would be regarded as perfectly okay to walk down the street in uniform, and people are not going, or unless you walk in an Islamic area, people are going to be perfectly okay and happy to see you. And every year, the president on Bastille Day associates himself with the armed might of the French state, and that is impressive. Uh, I think it's fair to say you don't see that sort of activity in Spain, for example, which is very much and also ran as a political power. So first of all, yes, militarily, the Europeans as a whole are a big problem. They are best suited for defence. They are limited value for offensive on out of area activities. I think that's true. Um, although a point I would make, I was once giving a lecture at the Naval War College in uh, Newport, uh, Rhode Island, and the then commandant, the Admiral, very kindly received me, and we had a very pleasant one-to-one -one conversation about strategy, and he was telling me about, you know, how much um, we were talking about China. The, naval, the Navy, right through the 2000s, was running an alternative foreign and defence policy yeah. pre predicated on That's right. <laughs> uh, and, and he was And he was saying how important India was. And I said to him, well, Admiral, I don't want to give to sort of rain on your parade, but I can't think of a single op occasion in which an Indian soldier has died in a war as an ally of the United States since World War II when obviously it was part of the British Empire. And I think that the, 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 that the military side that one needs to remember is not just ordinance or it's who's willing to fight. And I think one of the great strengths for the United States is some of its allies are. I think Australia is a marvelous ally for the, United, for the United States, but I think it needs to be realistic and the British have tried to be so. I hope we would be regarded as people that are willing to do so, but one has to be realistic. Other powers are not in that position. Now, as far as money is concerned, you're absolutely right. There is a real problem in the European project and in particular, the nature of the credit movements within Europe, the extent to which so much of the surplus uh, is held by Germany, not just Germany, of course, the Dutch as well, very important, but Germany in particular, which means that countries such which are in deficit to Germany, of which Italy is the classic example at the moment, though not the other example, not the only example, those countries are looking for other sources of liquidity. And that's one of the real challenges that the Chinese buy up readily companies there. And obviously there are open stock markets. Uh, there are only some industries that are kept, as it were, off that uh, base. One of the uh, good effects of open markets, um, you know, the, as it were, moving away from often inefficient um, state-run organizations is unfortunately those assets then can be readily bought up by foreign investors. So that is a problem and it's a particular problem because the Chinese operate not just through Chinese state organizations but through a large number of intermediary companies, not always just simply Chinese ones. So Jeremy, oh. let's, let, let's stick with that general theme. And, and uh, we did have some comment. If you could slide a little bit to I believe your right so that your, your, the screen is not Sorry. the, uh, well, I don't know if you can move your, your camera a little bit so that the window is not in the picture. Oh, do you uh, want me to take the window out? Uh, that might be a little better. There. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. Um, so let's stay in that general theme. Um, we had a question from Alvar Susar who asked, if you could talk a little bit about the expansion of Europe's high-speed rail through Poland and the Baltics and into Finland uh, via a Chinese finance tunnel, um, how does China benefit by bringing EU companies closer together? And is this sort of just counterbalancing Russian attempts at hegemony? Oh, well, I think you've got to accept that not every single Chinese investment is being run by a little committee sitting in a sort of a room underneath Beijing in which they have a master plan of the world. I mean, it's not all being run, as it were, as a sort of Fu Manchu project. But I, um, I think that the Chinese are, if you're on the level of a individual Chinese investor, I mean, let me give you an example. We have Chinese investment in buying student accommodation in Exeter. 
There are several reasons for that. One, we have Chinese students, of course. Two, it's quite frankly an easy and fraudulent method of moving money out of the People's Republic by people who are the middle class there, who are terrified that the state is going to become more powerful and is going to expropriate it. So they're looking, as many of them are, for just assets that are going to yield them some profit. But at the same time, there are, and you will know the controversy, I don't really wish, I've got nothing profound to say about it, the controversy over Chinese investment in 5G capability in Britain. There are anxieties, as you will know, about the extent to which, on the whole, Chinese investment is more generally linked to infrastructure and that that means that there is the anxiety of who has a, a ultimate control. And that's certainly a question in Britain. All right, so uh, our next question comes from Norman Sumner and asks about the two page ad paid for by Poland or an NGO in the Wall Street Journal uh, in the last week. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but if you are. Um, I have heard of the Wall Street Journal. It's name <laughs> crosses the Atlantic. Um, and so um, their ads seem to be understated in its objective, and he was wondering if you can comment on what they hope to achieve. Well, I haven't seen the ad, so I know the Wall Street Journal, but I haven't seen the ad. What does the ad say? It well, was long. I mean, it was it was a long, uh, you know, it was an essay on the role that Poland played mediating powers, and and you know, it was it was very complicated. It was not entirely clear what what the objective was but it was it was a massive literally an essay on uh you know what it's like to be overrun consistently and and a, a cautionary note about what role poland might be able to play in, in intermediating between those who would uh, overrun europe now right well let, let's just make a broad I mean, we can talk about polish uh, side if you like let's just make a broader point um one of the aspects in which Western countries, but not just Western countries, are any country that is non-authoritarian, are subject to foreign action, and we've seen this uh, repeatedly, um, is the extent to which we are open societies. So pretty well anybody um, can use opportunities to disseminate opinion, um, to represent their views, and in a sense, uh, that's all to the good. We want free debate. But on the other hand, one has to be aware um, that very clearly in the case of authoritarian societies, and we can see this very clearly in the case of Russia and China, um, there is an active uh, marshalling of opinion to their, uh, to their ends. So, for example, in Europe, I think it's generally understood that the Confucius Institutes, which are used by the um, Chinese government are, have their own, their own uh, particular agenda. I mean, I can tell you on a personal uh, a note here, um, I mean, I chose not to do this because I'm, I'm very wary of the Chinese government. Um, but um, in my university, if you're a member of staff and you want to go to the University of Beijing for two weeks, uh, you can. I mean, and the Chinese will pay. And I have absolute, I'm, as I said, I've always refused to go, but I have absolutely no doubt that you are not going to be introduced to any dissidents. You're not going to be introduced to anything by way of criticism of the Chinese government. You will find all conversation, at the very least, uh, pro the state. Whereas you will know that if you visit a country like Britain or the United States or Australia, you will meet people who have a diversity of views and you will be in a very different public space. And, you know, we're, we're aware of how these blandishments work, but I think that they, they are very purposed. Uh, and in that respect, we're back at the Cold War days. Cold War days, if you were invited, say, to go to some conference of, you know, um, sort of European intellectuals to discuss modern philosophy and literature in somewhere like Prague in 1985, you would know jolly well uh, that this was a, uh, a communist front and that this was going to be used to try and pump, uh, um, uh, pump for their purposes. 
So I think, I think that the, I mean, I think a whole generation in the West has forgotten the way in which authoritarian societies work, and in particular, in which they win allies. Certainly, it just, just parenthetically, guys, the, the investment the Chinese made dwarfs anything the Russians did. They've been doing this for 30 years in the, um, in the business of uh, universities in particular, to a, on a scale that is just unprecedented. I mean, they own faculties all over. So just throwing that in. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. Absolutely right. And I remember I've been several times to Japan. Well, I've not been to China to lecture, but I've been several times to Japan to lecture. And I was taken on one of these visits, which was sponsored by the Japanese foreign ministry, to meet the national security advisor. And he was telling me about, you know, he was quite open about it, about the amount of money that Japan could spend and the amount of money that China could spend. And he said, it is extraordinarily difficult for us to get our message across. And I was explaining to him at that stage, I think they had 10 million visitors a year. And I was explaining to him, you know, he was asking me why China had so many more visitors from the West. And I was explaining to him, well, in effect, it was not just being run as tourism industry. It was also being run as a branch of soft power uh, by the Chinese, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, so we had a question that just came in from Alexander um, Cheneso. Sorry if I, I butchered that. Um, given that the tensions between the U.S. and China are not likely going away anytime soon, how can European countries work realistically with both countries and not just pick one side or the other? Well, um, I mean, first of all, Trade will obviously continue with both sides, as, you, uh, as just as the United States trades actively with China at the present moment. But I don't think it's a choice between two equal uh, options, or it isn't in my view. In one, on one side, you have a very, very different political culture. You have a state which is actively seeking to change the nature of international relations. Um, it's what in the jargon is known as an unsatisfied power. And most European states, I would put it to you, are states which have an enormous interest in maintaining international stability. So I, I don't see it as an equal choice. I mean, I do, you know, I do understand that um, you can't simple, simply dismantle supply chains. You can't simply decide that you're not going to, tr to trade with a country which is roughly a sixth of the world's population. But equally, one has to be aware that there is a need for a high level of vigilance and also for preparation accordingly. One needs a sense of strategic institutions and strategic industries, and that needs to be shaped up. And I mean, uh, to take up Devon's point, um, the, you know, I mean, Britain has left the European Union. Uh, Britain still wants good relations with the European Union. Whether the European Union wants it, I don't know. But Britain still wants good relations. It is in our interests as a non-member of the EU that the EU tries to get its act together on matters of strategic, uh, you know, strategic ownership of industrial and economic assets. And I just hope they do. Sorry about that. Um, so we have a question from um, Jathan Park. Uh, if you look back into the past, which historic strategic competition would be the most analogous to the current US-China relationship? And what would be some qualifying conditions or differences? Well, that almost sounds like an essay plan, <laughs> doesn't it? Well, first of all, can I just say, as a historian, I've always argued that the thing that you should learn most from the past is that it is non-linear and that time is unpredictable. In other words, we never completely repeat the past. Now, obviously, a standard approach, it's an approach which I hope profoundly is wrong, is that you are getting here the classic relationship between a declining power and a rising power. I profoundly hope that is wrong because I very much uh, think that it is better for the interests of the world as a whole, including Chinese people, 
that the United States remi remains a strong and active uh, proponent and exponent of a set of values and is strongly able to defend the interests of itself and of neutrals and others. So I do not wish to see this as a rising and falling hegemonic position. What I do, would say is this, that China's problem is not a unique problem. You see other states which have become more powerful, Germany after 1871 is a good example, and which have sought to pursue what the Germans called their place in the sun, and have not always found that they have been able to operate the international system to do so peacefully. I mean, the Germans were pretty successful between 1871 and 1913. They weren't fighting wars, their economy was expanding, they were militarily powerful, and you know, they, you know, they managed to have a reasonable standard of living with a democratic society. You know, there were elections in Germany, there were opposition politicians. Um, but nevertheless, they found as a culture, it was very hard to accept the notion of limits. And they were also a society in which the option of going to war was too frequently considered as a possible one. So it's not surprising you get an international crisis in 1914 and they go to war. Now, I'm very much hoping that this is not the case with China. It would be better for all of us, including the Chinese, if they developed the notion of a rules-based system in which whatever their historical anger with societies such as Japan or Britain or the United States, whatever their views on uh, their wish to be regionally dominant and to be respected, it would be better if they could uh, understand that in terms of an international system in which might was not automatic with right, and in which there are other societies and states, both in the immediate area and more distantly, who are quite happy to have peaceful relations with China, but do not, as a result, just wish the Chinese to do what they want. I don't know whether the Chinese are going to be able to learn that, and because it is always difficult, not least because governments, even in an authoritarian society like China, there is a public opinion, there is aggressive nationalism, particularly at the expense of the Japanese, very aggressive attitude towards Taiwan. So it's partly a question of do the Chinese have the capacity to be a rising great power that doesn't throw its weight around too much, or, or the alternative. Since you're mostly Americans, let me give you an interesting analogy. The United States in 1865 had the second largest navy in the world, as well as a battle-hardened army of great uh, experience. And there was a lot of anxiety in international circles that the Americans might choose to pursue their interests or views in either Mexico or Canada or both or more widely uh, by use of force. Instead of which the United States in 1865 had the largest demobilization of its history, much greater one than the one in 1945 or the one in 1918-19. And that helped to make the United States a relative, you know, it's still pushed for its own advantage, but it didn't stage a foreign war till 1898. And that was a war that really didn't upset the world apple cart. Um, so it's really a question of how the Chinese respond. And that is an unpredictable way, un very unpredictable for us to, to, to work out, which is why if there is to be engagement, it has to be as part of a context in which there's also deterrence. And the two have to work side by side. Not to mention, just to throw in there, the economic instability going on in China. And yes. the, the major fears in China of political unrest from within the country. Yes, oh, I think you're absolutely right. There is also the institutional power of the PLA, the role of sorry, the People's Liberation Army, the way in which the PLA is centrally integrated into the economy, particularly into parts of the economy which aren't doing terribly well. Um, and, you know, there are all of these issues. And the question of whom precisely is in charge of the PLA is a very interesting one. In institutional terms, it's Chen Xi. How much he actually is in charge, nobody knows. 
So we've got a number of questions in, including from our trustee, Murray Levin, asking about uh, Huawei um, and the strategic importance with that. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, 5G and the controversy over Huawei, especially in Europe. And also in the wake of COVID, what that controversy is looking like and how that's, how that's changing. Yes, I think it's fair to say that uh, COVID has increased distrust of China quite considerably among states that are both um, would like to think of themselves as neutral, fair-minded, and others that are more pronounced one way or the other. Um, some of the uh, calls for action have been a bit foolish. I mean, I simply do not think the, it is sensible to imagine that the United Nations, which has both China and Russia on the Security Council as permanent members, is going to take a part in a sort of, um, you know, large scale inquiry into the origins of it. I just simply don't think that's practical politics. Um, but I certainly think that the nature of the Chinese role in 5G technology is now one in which there's enormous disquiet. As you know, it's been an issue in Britain. Um, the, I think it's fair to say that um, the, the trend is likely to be against encouraging Chinese investment. I think let's just put it like that. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means in terms of active intervention by the state is very difficult to tell because on the whole, um, the European states don't tend to play a major role in intervening on their stock markets when you have stock market investment. Because as you will know, the easiest way to infiltrate a place is to just buy existing companies. Um, but I suspect there will probably be more regulatory pressure in these areas, particularly if the United States throws tantrums. By which I don't mean to say the United States shouldn't. I mean, in other words, people will, are more likely to pay attention. I mean, you had this issue with the purchase, as we did, with the purchase of harbours. You will recall the purchase of harbours. Um, and that was an issue in, in the United States, not so much specifically China, but um, uh, you know, with, uh, with Gulf interests. Um, it's, I think these are going to become, people are going to scrutinize these things more, ob more obviously. An, an obvious way for the Chinese to invest or any foreigner to invest now is to buy airlines. Airlines, airline slots are very cheap. And I would not be surprised if there was need for enormous scrutiny in who is going to be buying through intermediaries shares in airlines. So we don't, we don't have a ton of more questions. So if anyone would like to submit more, we have about 15 more minutes. Um, but let's uh, ask this one from Richard Hobarth, Hobarth um, who asked something basically tangential to what you were just talking about. Germany, Germany recently made uh, moves to prevent vulture capitalism on the grounds of national security. Um, should this be something that's adopted more broadly across the EU um, and in the UK? And, and in fairness, the EU is talking about this. They're all talking about CFIUS like systems being put in place and, the, and, and, it's, and more scrutiny on these things. Yes, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if we think about this in, in general terms, there has been an enormous increase in the volume of financial instruments in circulation in the world since the 2008 crisis. Um, the uh, volume now of money traded each year as a multiple of the volume of goods traded is much, much greater. So in terms of gaining value, whether you're doing it for political purposes or non-political purposes, money instruments are the easiest way to do so. Um, and you could argue that, in fact, sometimes investing in uh, other purposes, let's say buying agricultural land, is a very slow uh, way to actually expand your power. Now, at the, I think the difficulty for, in both the United States and Europe, it's a different difficulty, but the difficulty in both of them is that um, the, the savings policy systems encourage foreign investment. In the United States, there is insufficient domestic saving. There is a tendency to run things on credit. 
Um, and there is a strong dollar which encourages foreign inflows and those inflows are obviously best placed in buying assets. I mean, you're better off buying an asset which is theoretically going to give you power and maybe um, you know a, a, a return on your capital rather than buying a financial instrument which at the moment is going to be returning you very little money. In the case of Europe, the problem is not so much, though it is a problem, that people don't save enough, enough. They, they do in places like Germany, save formidably. The problem re rather is that people are financing a very generous social welfare system, um, which the, the, uh, the root economy cannot support. And I think the one of the most interesting aspects of the COVID is that that has exacerbated that situation just as the shortage of savings has been exacerbated as a problem in the United States. And in both areas, whether you're talking about Europe or the United States, you have the problem of public expectations are, uh, are ridiculous, both sides of the Atlantic, and the state response is just to pump out money. Now, given that that's the case, it's not really surprising that there is this added problem of protecting yourself against um, investment. Um, and I think that that is going to get worse, not better, because given the choice, I don't see governments in either the United States or Europe being able to talk their citizenry into hard bargains. And the hard bargain in both cases requires probably lower living standards. In the case of Europe, the lower living standards would be lower social welfare. And in the case of the United States, it would be less credit. Um, so maybe that you, do, you don't replace your car every X number of years or whatever. Now, I don't think, I'm not quite sure how we're gonna get there. I really am not sure how we are going to get there indeed. And if you think about it, if you're, and I, and I certainly don't want to see, as you put it, vulture, ca vulture capitalism or, you know, predatory uh, foreign investment from hostile powers. But if you're not going to do that, the question is you have to really encourage the investment from domestic purposes. And the, dom and the citizenry, on the whole, doesn't want to do that. If you were to say to most people, in Britain or the United States or Spain, don't do this for the next 20 years, you will be better off in 40 years time. Most of them aren't gonna actually go along with that bargain. So I, I, you know, there is actually a, a, a question here. And I think the broader question which underlies this, and I think Devon brought it out brilliantly, we know that there are high rates of instability in China. We know that there are high rates of instability and opposition in Russia as well. The Russian economy is useless, it's a kleptocracy, it's a, it's a disastrous corrupt state. These authoritarian societies are saying that Western societies are weak because they cannot control their citizenry and they cannot persuade people to actually consent to difficulty. The reality is, I suspect that all societies across the world are finding this a systemic problem. The reason we should opt for our system is not always that it is more efficient. I don't think it is always more efficient. I mean, I'm not sure that Singapore wouldn't make a better job of running London than London will do so. And <laughs> Singapore's a pretty authoritarian place. But the reason, the reason why we should back our system is because actually it is culturally, politically, and ideologically the right alternative and the alternative that we see as part of our culture. The reason that China is a threat to us is bluntly that it is a different set of cultural norms in which the idea of an authoritarian state is well established. That state might be weak. President Xi might be weaker than he looks. President Putin might be weaker than he looks. But nevertheless, their form of weakness is not an attractive one. Whereas at least our form of weakness, you are about to have a general election, a presidential election, um, and, you know, you'll see all sorts of problems and issues and all the rest. And a lot of Americans will throw their hands up and think, how on earth do we get into this mess? Well, I think it's a better mess to be in than the kind of mess that there is in either Beijing or Moscow. Brilliant. Um, Eli, I'm seeing a whole lot of questions. Do you want to wrap? Do you want to sort of combine them? 
Yeah, so we have a bunch of questions that just came in. Um, Jeremy, if you could talk a little bit about perceptions of Belt and Road in wake of the COVID crisis, and also about, um, uh, you, is it possible that Europe would fill the vacuum of US leadership in the world as an alternative to the Chinese stepping up? Oh, let's take the second one. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't want to disillusion anybody, but there isn't one voice called Europe. You know, I mean, Henry Kissinger famously yeah. wanted, wanted there to be one when he rang Brussels. I mean, the fact of the matter is, there is that aspiration. President Macron has an aspiration with his idea of the multi-speed Europe in which there is an inner core presided over by President Macron in which, <laughs> uh, in which everybody which speaks with a united voice. Well, as you will know, you don't just need to go to Budapest or, or Warsaw. You won't even find Berlin interested in that. Marseille. Um, you know, so, so, so I think the difficulty is Europe itself, no. And the interesting, the interesting parallel here is look at the difficulties you've got where there is a structure of the ASEAN countries. The fact of the matter is that India, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, America, all agree, South Korea can all agree on the need of a rules-based system in the Asia-Pacific area, but they find it very difficult in practice to agree to actually do anything. I mean, the Americans do, and the Japanese and the Australians will train with the Americans, and Japan, Japan has an enormous navy, well, enormous, a large navy, uh, which is very impressive. But the reality is that international agreement is not easy. Now, I, so I don't think the Europeans are up to it. I'll be blunt on that. I really uh. don't. I think they have a differences of opinion. I think that the, the, um, the European Union um, and uh, has not, it's talked about trying to be a European substitute for NATO. It really lacks that capability, not just the military capability, the political capability. Um, so I can't see that happening. Now, can we wind back the first question, which was the belt and braces co and COVID in Europe? Um, belt and braces is changing slightly. Belt and road, Jer Jeremy. Oh, yeah, belt, belt and road, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> belt and road is changing slightly to have a bit more of an emphasis on rail links uh, than was the case when people were talking about it a couple of years ago. They still got um the obviously the attempt of the ring of pearls and all their bases and all the rest of it but now that they've run their first train directly uh through to um antwerp from um from, yeah you know it's, i mean the ports is a big component I the think. ports is a big component but i think that the overland route you see to china is strategically very interesting because they're aware that any maritime route is prone to and vulnerable to naval interdiction by Western powers and is also easier to scrutinize. Um, I think that uh, if, as long as China and Russia remain allies, um, you have a classic, for those of you who are geopoliticians, you have this classic issue of there is the so-called Mackinder's idea of the heartland, there it is, and what you have got, whether you're sitting there and looking at it from Delhi, Tokyo, or London, or indeed broader out, um, is the Rimland, to use a later term, and that that is vulnerable to the heartland. So the Belt and Road is another version of that. And But my view is that the, uh, the land capacity will probably be strategically more attractive and even more attractive because it's largely in their territorial waters, as long as their allies will be sending uh, shipments around the north of Russia. Uh, shipments that go from China around the north of Russia, uh, either uh, into the northern Atlantic, um, ending up in Rotterdam on the big container ports there, um, or possibly uh, stopping at Murmansk and going across rail routes from there. I think those may well actually, in geostrategic terms, be a better option for the Chinese in 50 years' time. There's one question, Eli, I don't know if you saw this one from Marshall Meyer that I wanted to make sure we, we addressed, which is, um, 
this question of what happens to the China-Russia detente. I mean, if, when it starts to fray, which it likely inevitably will, what, what would you say uh, the, the fallout would be in Europe uh, and elsewhere? Well, can I just say, I don't know, Marshall Mayer, I think that's a brilliant question. And I think it takes you back to Henry Kissinger's observation. Henry Kissinger's observation was that the United States should play off Russia and China and should reckon with each of them to be an ally for about 15 years and then switch. Now, <laughs> one of the, I mean, clearly, geostrategically, the very best thing that could happen is, as Marshall Mayer has pointed out, a weakness in that alliance because that, uh, that weakness removes or lessens the power of both of them to a greater extent than simply Western action alone. The problem that we've got here is how exactly are we going to do it? You know, in a way, the, for the, the only significant player on the Western side that has the capacity to do a meaningful deal is the United States. So that, go back to the previous question. Of course, you know, the Japanese talk to the Russians quite a lot, for example. Uh, you know, I mean, President Macron wants to talk, to talk to Putin a lot. Of course, people can talk to each other, but the only person that's going to deliver a convincing deal is a president of the United States. And uh, that's, you know, that's the only person that either the Russian leadership or the Chinese leadership would wish to deal with. Now, at the present moment, it's a little hard to see how that's going to move forward. But it's entirely possible that it could. We don't know in particular. The, the state of the two that is most unstable and weakest is Russia, not China. And that, again, creates an interesting set of perspectives because what happens if a post-Putin leader feels threatened more by China than by anybody else? There, I don't know. At the moment, unclear, uh, but those of you who are old enough will remember the sense of surprise. I mean, it was, you know, it was, uh, there were already signs of si Sino-Soviet rifts, but the fact that the Americans would be able to benefit from them was a matter of surprise, and it was a considerable achievement of both Nixon and Kissinger, um, you know, to, using Pakistani intermediaries in particular, to get there. Um, at the moment, there does not appear to be those openings, and um, I cannot see a reason for optimism. But on the other hand, and we have to bet on the fact that these two powers may remain allies. And, you know, if you want to use the historical analogy, uh, I don't wish to be offensive to President Putin, but the obvious historical analogy uh, is Stalin and Hitler. But in the case of China and Russia, they are uh, today, they are much closer ideologically uh, and in terms of their interests than Stalin and uh, Hitler were in 1939. Can I raise one thing that you mentioned, um, which which is kind of interesting in the in the rearrangement of alliances? You mentioned the the Indians not being something we should count on in this, you know, indeed if we are calling it a new Cold War. The the interesting thing there is that the Indians are very concerned about China, enormously yes. concerned. And when you moved from the Indians being a client state of the Soviets, and they weren't going to be in any way, shape, or form allied with our interests, that change you know in the in the 80s and uh, now the ch the indians are indeed very concerned about china and we do have we washington has established a much more built out strategic alliance with india so uh, i don't know which conflicts they should have been dying for us in but their my, my point about their their concern about china and their concern about china buying up india as well is is a real one Yes, I think you're absolutely right there. And of course, the extent to which China has links, continuing links with Pakistan, uh, keeps the Indian... Precisely, keeps, precisely. Keeps the India, and including now, of course, naval base at Gwalior, keeps the Indians very much on, on side. I think the difficulty is that the Indians also have this strong tradition of seeing themselves as a leading non-aligned power. Mm. And I all, and, and shall we say, um, on the whole, the United States is correct, uh, Devon, 
to argue that um, some Europeans, not all Europeans, but some Europeans have been freeloaders on the American defensive umbrella. Um, I think they also, to a degree, underplay the extent to which some non-European powers are a bit inclined to do the same. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I would say to you, you know, I, um, um, I think the Indians could do better, let's put it like that, um, in terms of getting themselves into a state to protect India against China, let alone to help in wider regional interests. So, um, again, it's a challenge for India and, uh, you know, we don't know where it's going to go, but I, their, their concern about China is likely to keep them on board. There's no doubt about that. And from the American viewpoint, which I think is an important one, allies are there because they vary. Sometimes there is a basis of mutuality, Sometimes there isn't a basis of mutuality. Sometimes there's just a common concern about a threatening power. At the moment, one of the things that China is doing is it is reviving people's understanding in the broader Asian area of the need for the cooperation with and the alliance of the United States. Um, Jeremy and Devin, I'm afraid our time has come to an end, but I'd like to sincerely thank you for a fascinating discussion. It was thoughtful, it was insightful, and it was typical of the things we do here at FPRI, so, so thank you. Um, to our audience, thank you for joining us today. Um, again, we can't do this without your support. I don't think there's anything like this you can see anywhere else. We, uh, this is what we do. And so please uh, check out our website at fpri.org if you haven't already. And uh, read Jeremy's article, which is featured on the website um, uh, that uh, concerns this topic. So thank you again for coming and um, stay safe. <laughs>